So we are ready to roll. Okay, so we we'll start right now, Roop, if you don't mind. Yes, yes, please. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me uh, immense pleasure and indeed a privilege to introduce Dr. Roop Gursahani. Uh, he is a neurologist who is uh, has special interest in epilepsy and for the last more than five years has been working on end of life care issues. Uh, he is the one of the founders of the End of Life Care for India Task Force. And uh, he brings uh, in his presentation uh, a, a lot of experience, uh, more so because of the fact that he was part of the three-person expert committee that examined Aruna Shanbag uh, at the request of the Supreme Court of India. So uh, apart from that, of course, he is a very dear friend of mine. And the rest of it, blah, 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 is not for, <laughs> for others to know, okay, uh, what we're up to. So uh, here goes uh, Roop, all the best and take it away from here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to thank uh, um, Gayatri Savita for, for encouraging me to take this series of uh, talks. This is the last of the uh, four. And uh, today I'll be discussing uh, end of life care policies. This is a topic that was suggested. But I realized that uh, just discussing policies is not going to make enough sense and we'll have to do uh, a little more of uh, ethics, law, guidelines, and so much more. So let me begin with uh, the first. I mean, we've all seen this slide. And sorry, what is this? Um, no, it's playing on its own. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, it kind of took off. Okay. So the first uh, slide is this, this one that I think everybody has seen enough number of times, and this is India not a country to die in. This comes from the uh, quality of death index survey that was done uh, first in 2010, uh, when India was the last of 40 large countries, and then repeated in 2015 when we improved a little. Um, because they found about 13 countries that were worse than us, and fortunately, both Pakistan and China were below us. So that was 2015. Uh, but uh, that doesn't take away from the fact that we are really, really doing pretty badly. Now, why is it that we are doing so badly? Before that, let us see what somebody does well. And this is, for instance, a hypothetical uh, British citizen who's uh, uh, in her late 70s, who's terminally ill, she can expect palliative care at home and admission to a hospice when required for an almost pain and symptom-free death. All the information she wants will be conveyed sensitively to her and her family with due regard to her autonomy and choices. Her values and wishes for end-of-life care will be discussed with her doctors and or trained counsellors and they'll be recorded in an actionable advanced medical directive. If a problem is neurologic or if she's unable to communicate and if there are complex issues of ethics, law and medicine that need to be addressed, then the UK has a special court of protection and this really takes the best interests of a parent's patriot. And all of these services are provided by public agencies. Uh, in all of this, the UK does significantly better than other rich countries and that is why it is right at the top. What about us? Well, why is India not a country to die in? And if you look at uh, the uh, quality of that uh, report, you can see these various factors on which we score badly. The first is, of course, the fact that we spend very little on healthcare overall, and that's something become, that's become very obvious in the COVID epidemic. The public sector is badly underinvested, and as far as we are concerned, on the private sector side, they have no awareness generally of end-of-life care issues. Government does have a policy for palliative care, but it is largely unimplemented. And this policy obviously would need to evolve by research, of which there is none. And unfortunately, we are, as far as the public is concerned, both a low demand for palliative care and a low supply. So on both aspects, we score rather badly. If you look at palliative care coverage by insurance, there is none. There is a new product that is coming in, um, and uh, but unfortunately, you have to pay for it in dollars. 
you can imagine it is meant for um, nri's parents what about public health care palliative care very variable outside kerala take opioid availability that's also quite variable but it's improving if you want family psycho social support well i think it's largely available only in the metro cities and there is no policy framework for shared decision making public engagement only kerala has public awareness of palliative care and volunteers and where it comes to dying matters in press there is minimal coverage in the national press what about legislation and professional guidelines well advanced medical directives and foregoing life support are constitutionally valid but effectively unimplementable we have guidelines from professional societies but there is low awareness about them these are enforceable but only through the consumer court it's not as though these are in, uh, enforceable directly organ transplant legislation which is also part of this end of life care is in places and is improving and we now have a do not resuscitate policy which has been published by the icmr and a policy for withholding life support uh, note my word which has been published by the aims and we'll come back to this a little later now the end the whole spectrum of end of life care it has multiple strands as you can see there's ethics there's legislation there's politics there's healthcare systems there's complex medical decision making but at the end of it it is there is also individual human suffering and the question is when something is everybody's business government medicine legal civil society everybody's business often becomes nobody's business but i put to you that this is basically a medical legal issue probably far more medical than even legal unfortunately instead of owning it the medical profession in india keeps looking to the legal profession to sort it out and i think that's a major mistake that we've been making so let's start by looking at the legal framework that we have and i have to thank dr dhwani mehta for uh, the contents of the slide uh, we begin with the constitution of india then we begin with something called the common law of the actual laws that we have for this you have the transplantation uh, uh, that is basically uh, thota then you have a triad of supreme court judgments but you have a fair number of professional guidelines and then there are a lot of other acts and codes that impinge on this the ipc the mental health care act the consumer protection act and so on and also the uh, mci regulations but they are all fairly diffuse if you look at it in a very very broad sense uh, we work uh, our we are guided by our sense of ethics uh, which in fact flows into what has been termed constitutional morality Uh, in terms of our work our practice uh, will be um, monitored by professional guidelines and institutional policies and between these two you get laws uh, laws are meant to be passed by uh, legislatures and when they uh, don't then judgments kind of uh, take up the place in between so you can understand that this is the framework on which we need to work Well, in 1950, we wrote ourselves the ultimate ethics software manual, which is still working well, almost seven, seventy years later. And uh, I don't know about you, I read the preamble, and it still gives me goosebumps. Well, if we look at actual laws, uh, the only law that we have that deals with this is the Transplantation of Human Organs and Tissues uh, Acts and Rules. the final version it says rules is is in 2014 but 1994 was when it was first uh, put out now it was a bit of jugad that was meant to address the issue of retrieval of organs for donation in the absence of a more comprehensive end of life care law and it recognized brain death as equal to circulatory death but unfortunately most of our medical profession understood it to apply only to the limited utility of organ transplant which as my friend dr dhwani mehta points out is an absurdity you cannot be dead under one law and not be dead overall so finally we have had some movement and again this has come from kerala late last year the government of kerala 
put out a government regulation it's not it's not a, a law but it's 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 a uh, it's a uh, order that has been put out by their uh, health department and they specifically said that if somebody is uh, if an individual is brain dead then life support should be withdrawn and this of course uh, would apply mainly to their public health system the steps that they advised is there should be a clear diagnosis of brain death and then there is a conversation uh, about the prognosis note conversation not consent for testing this is because testing for brain death uh, can a, can often be a contentious issue then you do the procedures which are fairly similar to those that have been given by thota so brain stem reflexes have to be checked by a panel of four doctors to be repeated after 6 hours and the apnea test is the last to be done in both sets and the time of death is a time that the arterial pco2 reaches the target in the second apnea test which is when you say that the apnea test is positive and uh, at this point a uh, brain stem death confirmation report is to be provided to the family and life support withdrawn um as i said i am not totally certain how this has gone after that and as you can imagine this is something that is pretty recent but i was really impressed uh, by this little bit of serendipity uh almost uh, well towards the early um, uh, 80s the united states put out something called the uh, uniform determination of death act which equated circulatory and brain death and said that brain death must be determined by acceptable medical standards and just this january there was this uh, uh, effort by a group of individuals to clarify um, uh, the anomalies that had arisen over the years now anomalies uh, in the us different states do their own thing so they the one anomaly was they said that the standard the originally it had said acceptable medical standards here they said that they actually specified the guidelines that you must use to determine brain death but note the point that i have put in the box reasonable efforts should be made to notify a patient's legally authorized decision maker make before performing a determination of death by neurologic criteria but consent is not required to initiate such an evaluation and that has been our understanding that this determination is actually a clinical test but as i said uh, this is something that uh, not everybody even in the intensive care uh, world agrees to and uh, this is something that has uh, although it's probably beginning to be enshrined in law needs to be confirmed okay so that's as far as the acts are concerned now let's move on to the supreme court's uh, involvement the first involvement of the supreme court was in 1996 with uh, and i have to thank uh, again dr dhwani mehta to for pointing out all of uh, these uh, details uh, the first was this uh, uh, judgment uh, called giankor versus the state of punjab which actually had to do with a, a, a kind of a dowry death and uh, here um, the then's chief justice actually made this point as part of this judgment uh, that uh, when somebody is in any case dying uh, when death due to termination of natural life is certain and imminent and the process of natural death has commenced these are not cases of extinguishing life but only of accelerating conclusion of the process of natural death which has already commenced we won't call it accelerating i i think we would term it allowing the process of natural death which has already commenced uh, but that was 1996 and uh, the supreme court went on to be involved the next being uh, uh, 2011 where uh, justice uh, kadju uh, deliberated on the case of aruna shanbag which was effectively where my own uh, personal involvement began um, uh, and here in this he effectively decriminalized what he called passive euthanasia but which basically means the withdrawal of life sustaining treatment from a person incapable of giving consent 
uh, dealt with the issue of brain death. But he confirmed that Aruna was not brain dead based on our medical report and decided that since her next of kin, which, he, uh, which was obvious were the nurses who were taking care of her, did not want withdrawal, he said uh, she, they could continue to take care of her. But he, and uh, this was uh, something that came, was to come again, prescribed completely impractical procedures for future cases, uh, which involved actually going to a high court. Now, um, uh, in between, there was, uh, uh, there was a report from the Law Commission uh, a little in 2012. And uh, uh, they looked at the concept of, uh, again, uh, for some reason, uh, uh, the legal system in India likes the term passive euthanasia. And they, they don't seem to like uh, uh, foregoing life support, which is the worldwide standard term. And here they made this gratuitous statement, living wills, whether written or oral, are controversial and can lead to mischief and therefore should be made legally ineffective, overriding the common law right of self-determination. I can't believe this. And why greedy relations who are interested in the wealth of the critically ill patient may stoop to malpractices with a nefarious design to hasten the process of death with the help of accommodative doctors. Doctors, citizens, everybody is corrupt. Well, so let us look at what are living wills and let's see um, whether the rest of the world agrees with this. Now, the whole question of living wills actually began in the late 60s in the United States and the USA is literally the world's laboratory for these instruments. So they were first discussed as a human rights concept. And why do I call them the world, the USA, the world's laboratory? Because uh, as it became... Uh, something that was taken up by citizens, politicians got into that and state after state did its own thing. So multiple flavors came out, states competed on uh, uh, better and more effective uh, uh, laws on this. And uh, almost all the US states had covered this. Eventually, the uh, US federal government created something called the US Patient Self-Determination Act, which applied to the whole of the US. And they have had DNR provisions, etc. from the early 1990s. The thing is that over this period of time, it has been realized that these conventional advanced directives and the living wills have had relatively little impact. Why? Because they are legal tools. People don't understand these forms. Patients' goals and preferences evolve. Uh, when you appoint a proxy, the proxy doesn't know that he or she is a proxy and doesn't understand the patient's wishes. Doctors are not aware of existing advanced medical directives. So it doesn't often influence care. And around the world, there's a marked variation in the legal validity of these instruments. So for instance, as I've just said in India, I mean, I'm going to come to that a little more beyond this. We have had it only since 2018 and they're practically never used. So the transition that has happened in the 2000s has been from a legal transactional approach to what has been called a communication approach. And the term that we now use is advanced care planning or ACP. And the emphasis now is on helping individuals understand, formulate, communicate their own goals and values, starting from healthy adulthood to illness onset and till the end of life. So this basically relies on open communication between everyone. And it prepares the whole system, but the patient and the surrogate decision maker for best possible in the moment, as it happens, shared decision making with clinicians. And if you do it right, I mean, that's the way it has to happen. So uh, for those of you who are from uh, uh, PGs in palliative care, I suggest you read these uh, papers. They are free on the net. Uh, because advanced care planning is something that we all need to be involved in. Uh, advanced care planning is a process that supports adults at any age or stage of health in understanding and sharing their personal values, life goals, and preferences regarding future medical care. For many people, this process involves choosing and preparing another trusted person or persons to make medical decisions when the person can no longer make his or her own decisions. And the goal of advanced care planning is to help ensure that people receive medical care that is consistent with their values, goals, and preferences during serious and chronic illness. So, look at the headline I put. 
there is no doubt that palliative care needs to own advanced care planning. And we, we need to uh, add this to our skills. What are the components of advanced care planning? The first and foremost is values clarification. So the patient has to understand what matters more, most, understand their own attitudes to the life-sustaining treatment, and understand the trade-offs that come between quality and quantity of life. Then there is communication between patients, proxies, uh, or surrogate decision makers, and clinicians. And if you look at it, these top two are our business in palliative care. Then comes, of course, the documentation. Uh, and finally, uh, these uh, preferences and so on are, first of all, stored in the brains of the surrogates. And obviously, then they go on to the electronic healthcare records as far as possible. How does it help? Uh, if, if proper advanced care planning is done, then aid, advanced directives get completed and there is an increased likelihood that clinicians and families will understand and comply. It reduces hospitalization, it reduces less uh, intensive treatments, it increases utilization of hospice. There is at least one RCT showing higher satisfaction with the quality of care. And there's emerging data showing that ACP reduces cost of end of life care. Now, how do you do it? And last year, I was uh, at the Advanced Care Planning International Conference in uh, Rotterdam. And uh, there really is an ACPI International, which has a biennial conference. If anybody is interested, I'm not sure if it happened, but 2021 was supposed to be in Singapore. And there are two paradigms. One is respecting choices which uh, in a sense is quality, but it really takes a fair amount of investment. So they have non-physician facilitators. There's a stepped approach uh, for healthy individuals, for people at the beginning of illness, and then for people who are at the end of death. And in the place where it began, which is a small town called La Crosse in Wisconsin, they actually cover almost 95% of deaths. It is that effective. Um, on the other side, the other alternative is uh, Advanced Care Planning Australia. And if anybody is interested, uh, the uh, stuff that they use is completely free on the net and you can all see it because it is funded by the Australian federal government. And what they do is uh, train uh, community uh, volunteer edu educators who uh, go ahead and hold meetings in their communities. And uh, then, of course, they have made sure that uh, uh, both the legal and the um, uh, uh, medical systems are involved. And here, too, coverage now crosses 50%. Uh, in the, uh, even uh, in the rest of the U.S., outside... Rup, your video has Yeah, I'm coming on. Not to worry. Okay. Go ahead. Got it? Am I back? Yes, we can see your slide. Uh, yeah. No, no, Rube. We are only seeing... Uh, uh, now we can. Now we can. Okay, yeah. So I think my connection dropped for a minute. Okay. So uh, this... Uh, advanced medical directive has been elaborated from the one that uh, Pallium India had up earlier. And uh, this is now, I mean, it's it's fairly simple. We've kept it very simple for Indian purposes. Um, 
and uh, it has uh, uh, specific conditions where it becomes applicable. It is basically applicable uh, for the end of life only. Uh, for restricting, it's meant to restrict uh, 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 life-sustaining therapy, and it needs the naming of uh, surrogate uh, decision makers. Now, the surrogate decision makers, uh, again, like uh, uh, most standards, we would like to have at least three listed, and they're not supposed to work as a committee. Uh, it's the first in the list who is who uh, uh, is the first. It's only when the second, he's not or she is not available, then the second comes on and then the third. Uh, although uh, in most situations, you do expect them to confer with each other. And this is a, uh, is, is a document that can be revoked instantly orally. Uh, for anybody who's interested, this document is available on multiple websites, uh, including the IPC website, Vidhi's web website, and Palimandia. But where are we today in the, in the status of this? Well, in March 2018, uh, the then... Uh, uh, Chief Justice put out this judgment, which when we first saw it, we thought it was really, it had made a lot of change, and but we realized it's, it has major flaws. Uh, basically, over a period of uh, uh, almost a year and a half, uh, the Supreme Court of India literally brought our liberty, uh, which was of the 1950s, of thought, expression, belief, faith, worship, into the 21st century by extending it to privacy in the judgment that was called Puttaswami, health autonomy, which is what we are concerned with, and sexual choice, where uh, 377 was written down. Um, well, uh, this judgment has been called the Common Cause versus Union of India judgment, and it confirmed and it had a fairly elaborate uh, explanation uh, and a reasoning, constitutional reasoning, why the right to refuse medical treatment had its basis in the rights to autonomy, dignity, and privacy. So it finally wrote it down into uh, our constitutional rights. And it provided the constitutional basis for both advanced medical directives and withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. And unlike in the other two judgments where they kind of just laid down broad principles, here they actually put down safeguards and guidelines, which unfortunately made for a lot of problems for us. So. The advanced medical directive that I showed you is applicable as per them only to identify terminal illness. So it is, well, a healthy individual who's concerned about future brain disease or damage maybe cannot use it. Then it has to be signed before a judicial magistrate first class, preserved in the district court and informed to the family so that privacy also be done. And as yet, after doing all this, uh, it really has still not percolated down to the lower uh, judiciary. So you can understand where we are. So 40 to 50 years after the rest of the world and 21 months after this judgment, finally, somebody actually registered their living will in the Chandigarh court. And they claim to be the first persons in the country to execute their advanced directives after the JMFC was forced to do so by an order passed by the district judge. And uh, as you can imagine, the person who got it done is not just a former vice chancellor of the Agra University, but he's a former chairman of the law department of Punjab University. So I'm sure the district judge might have been a student or something. Whatever. Um, as opposed to this, where are we in terms of uh, uh, where the US is concerned? Uh, this is a document that is available for download from the American Bar Association it looks at different states and their different flavors. For instance, uh, if you look at uh, Arkansas, um, uh, see here, it takes two witnesses or notary, doesn't require both. If there, is, if, there is, uh, if there are witnesses, then at least one of the witnesses should not be relative spouse, beneficiary and so on. Uh, again, notarization, or witness, which means just one witness is enough. Um, so 40 to 50 years after the rest of the world and so many, so much time after the common cause judgment, why are we still stuck? So a little before this had happened, I had written to one of the authorities in the US 
uh, discussing with him what was happening. And this was what he had uh, written back to me. There's a risk that any legal tool can be abused. So a 0% risk cannot be the test or standard. The point is that these are overwhelmingly safe instruments. They help hundreds of thousands avoid treatment that they do not want. Perhaps, he says, he wasn't very sure, but he said only a 10 to 20 documented cases of abuse in 40 years of advanced directive use in the USA. So much for corrupt, nefarious doctors, relatives, and so on. So this is the advice that I give and that I have been giving uh, to anybody who connects with me on this or where I speak. I suggest that uh, you should speak to those close to you because this is basically a conversation. Choose your surrogates, confirm that they accept the responsibility, understand your wishes, will follow them, decide whether they can have any discretion or not because you can actually say that this is what I want. I don't want you to have any discretion. Make this directive. It has to be signed in front of two witnesses and you will have to try and get the signature in the presence of and attested by a judicial magistrate first class. It's quite possible that you may have to engage a lawyer to help you do that if you want it to be done fully. Um, though I recommend that if not, at least you do the rest of the exercise. But for all of us, for patients, the next is to actually to show it to every doctor. And this is why I explain it to my patients. You will find out if the doctor will support it. The doctor will understand what their hospital's policies is. Uh, and the host doctor will know your wishes. More importantly, uh, I'm kind of enlisting the general public to start educating the medical community. Now this judgment, going back to the judgment, also prescribed a procedure for withdrawal of life-sustaining treatment. Now this uh, procedure was considered to be the same whether the person had or did not have an advanced medical directive. They accepted that the decision making would be done by the doctors, uh, preferably under a hospital oversight committee. But then after that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the previous the Aruna Shanbagh judgment had gone to the high court. Here they said district collector. But again, the district collector and the judicial magistrate first class should monitor the whole process. And uh, uh, obviously, you can understand this is something that uh, uh, is not going to happen. Because uh, it's, I don't know if you understand, but the judicial magistrate first class is effectively uh, the person who's the most hardworking in the whole uh, subordinate judiciary. And unlike in the advanced medical directive, there has been no news of this procedure having been applied at all anywhere so far. So, uh, elicit. Uh, Dr. Dhani Mehta uh, led this effort. We filed what is called an interim application in the Supreme Court. It took us quite some time before it was heard. And uh, the Supreme Court, uh, you can see what the uh, union government had to say. They said that uh, these guys are asking for diluting the safeguards that were given. Uh, nothing. We, we, we don't support that. The judicial magistrate, the district collector, all of them must continue to be involved. But the Supreme Court accepted that uh, this was probably not the way it should be. And they asked for a um, joint meeting of all the stakeholders between the ministry and, well, the stakeholders. And this was in January. Uh, the deadline was 10 days. Anyway, so let's move on. We've uh, covered the Supreme Court judgments. Let's look at professional guidelines. And in terms of professional guidelines, uh, this effort began uh, thanks to Dr. Mani and Dr. Simha and a whole number of other people uh, in the intensive care community and the palliative care community. Uh, some of them are there on this meeting. And uh, this was put out at, in 2012 and then again in 2014. Um, and this basically uh, looked at accurately they, they gave a whole uh, list of steps to follow. And uh, basically, it begins with the determination of medical futility. Uh, now, what is medical futility? Uh, there is, uh, there are, of course, if you look at the list, there are something like five or six different versions that people look at, but there are essentially three. 
physiologic, quantitative, and qualitative. Physiologic is when the treatment that you give does not produce any intended physiologic effect or achieve any goals. So, for instance, if you give antibiotics for viral infection, even a layperson knows it's useless. What about quantitative? Quantitative is when the chance of producing the desired effect is very, very low. So if you have an elderly patient with end-stage hepatic cirrhosis and develops multi-organ failure, the chance of survival is, well, probably less than 1%. The last is qualitative, where treatment has the desired physiological effect, but the effects are essentially useless or worthless. Uh, probably having no value for quality of life or maybe even controversial in terms of justifiability. For instance, CPR that result, results in a persistent vegetative state or giving uh, unaffordable chemotherapy to somebody who in any case has a survival of just one or two months. So if you look at the steps that you do once you uh, assess futility, uh, you have to establish consensus amongst all healthcare providers. This has to be done. Without this, do not go further. Uh, if the patient is competent, then the patient obviously needs an honest disclosure and uh, the discussion then proceeds from this point on. If the patient is incompetent, which is very often in, in the end of life situation, uh, you then decide, you try to find out whether an advanced medical directive is available. If an advanced medical directive is available and valid, which is a situation that you may have, uh, um, if it is valid in the sense that uh, it is appropriately signed, uh, it is supported by the surrogate decision makers, then you would be advised to take it on board and follow uh, uh, what it says. If it is not available, then the first step is to find out whether the person had expressed any wishes. And this often the surrogates, when they are prompted, they may be able to tell you that, yes, these were the wishes. And then again, you follow the procedure for uh, you know, foregoing life support, either withdraw, withdrawing or, uh, uh, withdrawal or withholding uh, as per this uh, document. And uh, when you deal with the surrogate decision makers, you need to confirm uh, hierarchy and confirm consensus amongst them. Uh, it's very, very clear that uh, if uh, there are multiple surrogates, and if the hierarchy is not very clear cut, then you absolutely need consensus amongst them. If not, then again, you stop. Complete documentation with a detailed clinical note signed by the appropriate surrogates and the three consultants. And ideally, there should be an institutional mechanism for post facto audit, which means a clinical ethics committee. Now, what do we have that really supports all of this? And fortunately, we have two documents that have come out into the public domain. And as it so happens, they, they came barely within a couple of months of each other. Uh, the Indian Journal of Medical Research published this policy document from the Indian Council of Medical Research. I, Dr. Rajmani, Dr. Dhani Mehta, we were part of this. And this effort was really led by um, uh, Dr. Roli Mathur, who actually finally made it happen. And uh, uh, remember that CPR was something that was devised almost about 35 to 40 years ago. And the DNR order came uh, almost about 25 years ago. And it is understood in terms of the ethics that if there is an unexpected cardiopulmonary arrest where resuscitation may have physiologic effect and no information is available, it is important to presume consent and attempt resuscitation. But it's not reasonable to continue to rely on such a presumption without promptly and actively seeking to clarify the patient's and or surrogate's wishes, uh, especially if this is not very clear cut. So what this document did was give an, an algorithm. Um, if somebody has no risk of CPR, then you... If I open the mute, then I mother will let the call. Sorry, hello, somebody needs to be muted. Yeah. So, uh, what about if CPR does have realistic chance of success? Uh, it actually said that you just go ahead and do it. 
uh, which we actually didn't agree with. We thought that uh, the individual concerned does have a, a right to discuss their own values, but theke, so far as it is, this is the position that has been stated. If the patient, then you, if, it, if you're not sure whether the CPR is going to be successful, then you decide uh, whether the patient is competent or not to be consulted about it. If the patient is uh, 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 competent, then the discussion has to be done with the patient. And if the patient is not competent, then with the surrogate. And this is clearly, clearly stated. It means that we can no longer dump all these decisions on surrogates when the patient is conscious. But at the end of it, the CPR is a, a, a medical procedure and the final decision uh, well, is something that the physician has to do. Uh, sorry, somebody needs to be muted again. Okay. Yeah. So after you've discussed... Everybody, please mute your mics. Please mute your mics, everybody. So after you have discussed this in, uh, 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 with the uh, patient or the surrogates, take decisions in the best interest of the patient. Remember that the final decision still remains with the physician. And even if they are DNR orders, supportive care and compassionate care has to be continued. Now, um, you know, if CPR does have a realistic chance of success, uh, remember that on the flip side, and this comes from the 2018 judgment, all adults with capacity to consent have the right of self-determination. And the adult has the right to refuse specific treatment, even if such a decision entails a risk of death. The emergency principle can be given effect to only when it is not practicable to obtain the patient's consent, but where a patient has already made a valid advanced medical directive, which is free from reasonable doubt, and specifying that he or she does not wish to be treated, then that directive has to be given effect to. So uh, you're seeing some amount of clarity here. Now, as part of this document, there is a DNAR form, which I suggest that you should ask for your institution to print and keep ready for use. Ideally, we need this as part of a larger document. And this larger document allows for multiple options, uh, including comfort measures, limited treatment, and full treatment. And this document is called the Physician's Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatments. Uh, in the US, these are printed on fluorescent paper. Uh, they go into the medical records. They go everywhere. And at home, they are supposed to be put up on the fridge door so that if you are found, if somebody is found down and uh, paramedics come in, that's where they look to see if uh, there are orders for what to do. Right. And then the next remarkable document that came out, and for that we have to thank uh, our Dr. Sushma Bhatnagar for this, was a working document that was released on the AIMS website uh, somewhere in late May 2020. It's sound, signed out by the director of AIMS, the chairman of the ethics committee, and uh, something like about 13 or 14 senior clinical professors. They've made it clear that it awaits formal uh, government uh, approval. But in the meantime, they put out the, these, the seven-step pathway for uh, AIMS uh, management. Uh, recognition of futility, clinician's consensus, explanation of progress, uh, prognosis, uh, initiation of end-of-life care, then assessment, uh, documentation, and obviously feedback. And uh, it has forms that I think anybody can use since AIMS is a statutory uh, government body, I think we should accept that unless specifically countermanded, we can all use these. This is the standard document for uh, taking a second opinion from someone else in, in your own specialty uh, before uh, 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 withholding uh, takes place. And this is a checklist to see that uh, uh, these, these uh, details have been properly communicated. But what I found uh, really, um, I mean, I was very, very pleasantly surprised. And that was this list for uh, the surrogate hierarchy. 
Excuse what me. What could have happened? Will you please. Help, please. Help, I don't. Uh, one second. I'm muting. I'm muting. Yeah. Done. So, uh, if you look at, uh, if somebody has looked at uh, the Human Organ Transplant Act, it has a jumbled up list of uh, uh, all the people who can contribute to that decision without any statement of who takes uh, priority of whom, over whom. This document actually sp states spouse, de facto spouse, literally very advanced, partner or a friend of long standing who regularly attends to the patient in the hospital. Um, available adult children, available parents, available siblings and so on. Now this hierarchy uh, I would strongly recommend that all of us support uh, in the sense that uh, I'm sure that there will be further uh, discussion, there may be uh, court decision making, but as far as it goes, uh, this should be what we should all follow. And if, if there is conflict, then obviously you refer it to the Institutional Advisory End of Life Care Committee before it, if, if, if it really is a conflict, then it goes to the courts. But there's an interesting point, and I'm not sure uh, this is probably deliberate. Both the DNAR policy document and the AIMS guidelines actually discuss withholding. They do not tread onto the sensitive territory of withdrawal because that's been covered by the 2018 judgment. Now, withholding and withdrawal are both medically, ethically, and legally for the rest of the world equivalent. But to the layperson, withholding is emotionally easier. In practice, for instance, if I have an individual who's, uh, who's severely brain damaged uh, and where, uh, 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 well, uh, they are at the stage where you need to convert the endotracheal tube to a tracheostomy, then what we would term palliative extubation is framed as withholding tracheostomy and the CPR. Uh, the endotracheal tube has to be removed in any case. But doing a tracheostomy is a procedure that can be withheld. And families find it emotionally easier. I guess the Supreme Court also found it emotionally easier. Now, so you will tell me that all of this is, uh, well, okay and fine and uh, the glass is half empty. Uh, depending on... Uh, whether you're a surrealist or a relativist or whatever, I'm an optimist. The glass is half full as far as I'm concerned. Uh, uh, and obviously, you can see a utopist who thinks that the water should be in the upper end. Please remember that we are now at the stage where we have to deliberately practice using guidelines in such a fashion that laws and judgments eventually follow. Uh, remember that uh, the basic principles of biomedical ethics are fairly clear cut. Uh, it will be. It is interesting to note that this book, first written in 1979, is in its seventh edition of the same two authors. Amazing. I, I think that must be a record. But when you try to apply uh, these four basic ethics, you actually have to work them together. And I don't have the time, but I would suggest that you look at the four box model for applying it to a given individual patient. I'll leave this for the time being. Uh, for those of us who say that uh, this is, uh, 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 is something that, uh, uh, well, you can't force me to do it. Remember that, as I said earlier, uh, courts will follow published guidelines. And in the West, maximum litigation is about a wrongful CPR. There was one case where, uh, um, in fact, uh, a hospital was fine because they kept a, uh, a patient on the ventilator, brain dead patient on the ventilator. And remember that where it comes to DNAR, the premier medical think tank of the Indian government has told you that this is good medical practice. So again, uh, when we come back and we look at the medical profession being responsible for this, this is finally, I think, palliative care's responsibility. Uh, and the medical profession should not look at the legal to, uh, to bail it out. Uh, why does the medical profession shy away? If you ask patients, they will say perverse incentives or corporatization in the sense that 
uh, big hospitals make money out of this, which I think is actually quite, quite incorrect. But it's also because of lack of legal clarity without any clear regulatory requirements and so on. It's because of difficulties in establishing prognosis, but most important is because of a lack of capacity. There's a complete absence of skills or training in palliative care, end of life care or communications for the general medical community. Um, so in that sense, again, it comes back to the responsibility of palliative care. I know that palliative care uh, is much more than end of life care, but we as PC physicians are majorly responsible and competent to manage it. The real challenge is to make palliative care move out of its onco comfort zone and into the hospital and the ICU, and then make both intensive and palliative care come together. So this is when Elicit was formed almost five years ago. You can see Dr. Nagesh Sina there. Uh, this was when um, the, uh, the critical care medicine and the Indian Association of Palliative had already come together, and then we neurologists decided to join the party. Um, there are problems with integrating palliative and intensive care, uh, most especially because um, the cultures are different. But I can tell you that this is something that actually is beginning to happen. Uh, in my own hospital, uh, Dr. Jairajan actually attends ICU rounds and uh, uh, you can see the residents are actually beginning to pick this up. Uh, there is, five years ago, Dr. Mani wrote that there's enough constitutional and legal protection for life support limitation in India. Remember that this whole issue is decriminalized. Um, and as I said, if at all cases are likely, they are more likely to be in consumer court for overtreatment. Doing right is never illegal. Due process has to be followed and documentation has to be complete. Uh, sorry, this is the uh, slide that I meant to show. Uh, a Delhi hospital was fined 5 lakhs for keeping a brain dead boy alive. So end of life care needs an overall law. Elicit actually did draft a law which took into account uh, this validation of autonomy, establishment of due process, uniform recognition of death. And this was not a law that had any financial implications. But uh, you would say then, why do we need a law? Uh, because the Supreme Court judgment has already done the necessary constitutional heavy lifting, but they're prescribed in practical procedures. Uh, so you need a law because you need public discussion and it's only a law that can reconcile all this, set procedures, and actually enforce it. Thou shalt, thou shalt not, on pain off, and so on. I'm going to finish with uh, actually looking back uh, at the whole concept of a good death and why it is so difficult for Indians. Uh, look at all of this. One major component is knowledge, prognosis being delivered, honesty, accuracy, and optimism where few Indian doctors have training in communication skills. Then the basic Kubler-Ross stages of acceptance and the whole phenomenon of life review and closure. Uh, well, again, palliative care counseling services are difficult to access, though we plan to uh, set up an uh, uh, online training course. Uh, uh, this will hopefully uh, take place soon through Karunashray. What about autonomy? Uh, remember that the advanced medical directive is valid, but the procedure is not. Uh, again, healthcare power of attorney also is in the same gray zone. Um, withdrawal of life-sustaining therapy is again, uh, the Supreme Court prescribed procedure is a barrier, but withholding is possible under common law and it is covered in our guidelines. So people who prepare uh, are protected by their ability to withhold uh, life-sustaining treatment. What about palliative care? Um, there are many barriers to adequate palliative care, and I don't really want to go into this, but uh, some things that we should be able to start doing something about is making pastoral and uh, bereavement services available. I'm going to end at this point. Uh, my uh, email ID is here, so if anybody wants this presentation or wants any of the documents, uh, that I have alluded to, I'm more than happy to share uh, them. I think I have taken a little more time than I had intended, but thank you so much. There are two topics I have not covered. 
uh, which I realized I want at the time. One is donation after cardiac de death, and the other is uh, medical aid in dying, which again is for some other time. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to stop sharing at this point. Yeah. Sorry. Um, I, where is this? So, yeah. so thank you uh, very much, Ru, for an awesome presentation as usual. Uh, I will hand over to to Jaita. Uh, I'm sure that there are lots of questions. Uh, it's just uh, one minute to eight thirty. If you're talking about an hour's lecture. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I leave it to the others if they would like to stay on you're, and you're happy to answer. Otherwise, uh, perhaps we need to have, a, uh, you know, one more you running away. Uh, where you can answer all the questions. So, Jaita, but, over to you. Are you running away? I can't leave the door of my house. How can I have a panga with you? you know? <laughs> <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much, Roop, for um, that is why we did ask you to take this uh, particular talk. You did it exactly as uh, we were hoping you would. The other bits which you couldn't cover obviously couldn't have been covered in uh, uh, this particular session. So thanks so much. Um, there are a couple of questions that have come up. Uh, one is that uh, somebody has answered it already as to who needs to certify the living will. Is it the magistrate, notary, yes. or, or plain paper? But that's been that's been said now that it has hey, to be two witnesses. And I muted it. No problems. Go ahead. Right, okay. Uh, about the two witnesses and the judicial magistrate first class, that still remains. Um, there's one uh, interesting, uh, uh, so, the, so the lawyers on this group and the law uh, uh, firms on this group have been very proactive in asking about doctors' inputs and the document and, and other people have said that, yes. Um, one is about children in this policy statement. What is the age cutoff? And is the parent always the surrogate? What if a person, uh, what if a child is 15 or 16 years old and is able to make his or her own uh, decision? So uh, what about them? That also has been partly answered in the chat, but if you would like to take on. Uh, is Dr. Dhwani Mehta there? I just, uh, can you see her? Uh... Yes, I'm here. Uh, she's, she's, uh, okay. she's only uh, said it, Dr. Dhwani. Yeah, yeah. Only, so you uh, answered, do you want to speak it? I mean, you might, might as well answer. Yeah, I think it's an important point so that everybody knows if, if they're not on sure. that list. Sure, I think the question was in relation to the DNR policy. So yes, according to that policy statement, uh, a person will be considered a child until the age of 18. So any official signature on that uh, DNAR form will have to be by the parent, if they are available, or if they are not, uh, anyone who is considered the legal guardian of the child. But I think it would be good practice, and I've seen this in DNAR forms in other countries, where a child is of an age where they are able to express their wishes, that these wishes are taken into consideration, the child is consulted. This is also recorded in the form. We currently haven't included it, because I think the focus of that particular uh, policy document was primarily on uh, on adults uh, and we realized that perhaps pediatricians need to weigh in on this in a little more detail but uh, essentially uh, you would have to have a parent sign off on on a document like this or or a legal guardian whoever is available so there is a, a, another question related to this. Uh, somebody has asked, what about an adopted child? But I guess that- Adopted child is of course a, considered a, yeah. as a legal as a child. child. Yeah, parent. Yeah, and uh, it's about the emphasis on the CPR. What if someone who is eligible for DNAR needs intubation for respiratory distress? This is for Roop. Sorry, I didn't- uh... So uh, for the CPR, we said that first we are going to talk to the patient, right? If yes, we can yes, talk yes. to the patient, only the patient is not, we are not able to converse, then only we go on to the surrogate, so the family members. So yeah. what if someone who is eligible for DNAR, but he needs intubation for respiratory distress? 
if you have not discussed this then uh, you have no choice but to go ahead and do the intubation because uh, unless this has been clarified that uh, you have to go ahead with emergency uh, management uh, which is why the whole business and quite rightly so for us at this stage of time is all entirely about withholding you have to talk about this in advance you have to be prepared right um there's another question as to how do we proceed in a medical legal case such as overdose of a chemotherapy prescription in an unresponsive patient not responding to intensive care support where clinical consensus decision is for de escalation but family insists on continuing support in the icu wow that's that's a so complex. basically clinical clinically it is for de escalation for whatever reason that has happened but family wants to continue so i guess this is where the conversation needs to happen but anyway over you yeah, but again there there again uh, comes the whole question of shared decision making consensus amongst uh, the treating team then reaching out to the surrogates uh, identifying the surrogate hierarchy uh, for instance uh, i'm right now in a in a situation where uh, uh, the wife and the daughter are on one side and a sister is on another side so these are things where you have to be extremely clear about making telling the surrogates what the hierarchy is uh, at least letting them know that there is a hierarchy and then pushing for a consensus you know uh, very often uh, uh, i mean you might have a spouse you might have adult children and the parents still insist on uh, uh, calling the shots whereas actually in a surrogate hierarchy they come number 3 or 4 right um there is a question uh, there's a common question that intensivists ask is how legal is the icmr dnar paper what do we tell them and the hospital admin it has been put out by the icmr that's a, as i said it's the government's premier think tank if you perform cpr in a patient where uh, if the patient has specifically refused it you are well um, if nothing else the consumer court is going to have a go at you right um so i i i i think it is as legal as can be and again it is that glass half full half empty We yeah, are going to, we are going to work on. Dhwani, please explain this issue because again we come back to the same thing. Yeah, no. Again, I'll I'll just reiterate how the one. Of course, as as Dr. Roop has already said, this is a document issued by an authoritative public body. Now, why that's important from a legal perspective is because the court, when deciding whether an appropriate standard of care has been administered or not. we we'll look at professional guidelines and there can't be a more authoritative professional guideline than that of a uh, that, that of the icmr uh, you know whatever reservations we might have about it at the moment so uh, this is uh, it's entirely legal to to follow the the guidelines laid down in this document okay thank you dr dhwani um dr simha has said that the covid situation complicates issues so any comments on that dr roop um yeah so the covid situation um, has brought all of this to a head and uh, i think that uh, uh, all units dealing with covid should uh, not only upskill themselves very rapidly on the communication skills that are required and if anybody is interested uh, pallium india is running a course Uh, called the pali covid uh, course which is which is literally a weeks jhatpat uh, course on uh, uh, palliative care for specifically for covid and uh, you should have the dnar document up i mean i have asked my hospital to prepare it on a hospital letterhead and have it available um dr ramchandran has said that patient's family physician must have a role in end of life care absolutely absolutely no argument about that and i strongly think that family physicians uh, now need to upskill themselves on palliative care and uh, on the basics of palliative care and uh, um, uh, i can tell you that uh, 
those of us who practice in mumbai where fortunately family physicians are fairly active still uh, towards the end of life when the patient is at home we go out of our way to reach out to the family physician and involve them out of our way i mean we 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 think of them as the then i mean we literally hand over the patient to the family physician right there is a, a a bit of a confusing thing about a legal issue of any physician assisted euthanasia on terminally ill patients request okay so, so um vani i'll i'll quickly finish my bit of and then uh, i would then you would also can come you guys come in please uh, my assumption is that this whole field provided we as doctors keep it moving forward will evolve and it will take two or three decades or more before our jurisprudence is willing to support or even look at that dwani your comments absolutely i mean look at I, i think from your presentation it was clear that we are very far behind on the curve at the moment physician assisted suicide okay. and have Sorry, Continue, uh, I've muted. Yeah. Sure, sure. No, so other countries have obviously moved on to discussing the legalization of physician-assisted suicide and physician-assisted dying. Uh, we are still at a stage where it's difficult to execute advanced medical directives, and doctors are still wary about the legal, uh, you know, validity of withholding or withdrawing life-sustaining treatment or uh, carrying out DNAR. So. there's a long way to go before we can put procedures like this uh, in place for the i mean very simply at the moment it isn't physician assisted suicide is not legal uh, and this will require uh, the court at least has indicated for the moment that this will require a law by parliament to to authorize something like this so but it's a little interesting vani uh, um, yeah. you know for canada yeah uh, it's it's of course in the netherlands it came out as a as uh, out of public discussion and an actual law sure but in canada it was uh, judicial it, it can be judicial i'm not saying it 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 can't it, it it won't perhaps at some stage it will be but given that our even our debate in the judiciary at the moment is still you know we like 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 the lines from the judgment that you pointed out if there's still such a suspicion of doctors and you know grasping family members looking to get hold of people's property as in it's going to take us a while before even the judicial culture understands that perhaps the natural extension of the right to autonomy is to allow the legalization of physician assisted suicide i if we are still having confusions about just withdrawing and withholding i think we are far far away from physician assisted suicide so i think that uh, that uh, sort of adds to the complexity and uh, it, it of course it's clarified that the icmr document addresses only dnar and not the that that's what uh, dr dhwani you've written and madam rajni here has written so that is uh, uh, that is for that is to be uh, clarified um i think those uh, a lot of uh, these were sort of comments on this and their questions and we are at 842 so two more minutes if anyone has any questions yeah i think on the chat i can't see no not any so i'm just opening uh should we intubate should we intubate for respiratory distress we did so do you want to say again or yeah that is already covered right it was covered okay so for all of you who have it attended, was covered but she lost connection so it could be repeated Roop, for her benefit roop can you just uh, answer that again yeah so intubating for respiratory distress if you have not discussed uh, cpr then uh, you have to do it i mean in an emergency you have to provide emergency services and so uh, one more from dr shafika there always seems to be a gray area when giving the patient palliative sedation in such situation should we document that two physicians concurring with the palliative sedation um dhwani do you uh, would you want to 
get in on this but i it's it's a little i mean it's it's a, a tricky zone even for uh, uh, palliative physicians to uh, enter on so i i think maybe this is something that we can uh, leave for another time and and this that will basically be be a pure palliative care physicians uh, discussion we we should have that sometime i suppose and dr rajeshree has said that icmr has given a separate statement on withholding and withdrawal clarifying that it is not passive euthanasia so that is yeah. so right anything you would like doc, dr simha would you like to add something dr dhwani would you like to add something else I I don't have anything else to add. Yeah. Okay. Except if you have any questions, please feel free to write to me as well. I'm just going to type my I email think, uh, in the. Stan, Stan wanted to ask something. Stan, you wanted to ask something. You'll have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, I think the problem is there is not enough ownership of this whole thing by the medical profession. you know this end of life care policy or a joint statement by the two societies and then neurology joining later it's now 5 years more than 5 years 6 years now and we're still talking the same thing we're having all these lectures all this but what is needed is massive upskilling of you know physicians and nurses and all those involved in healthcare and proper integration unless integration happens we are going to go on talking like this and you know and people are going to suffer and die that's true while we are talking there that's what is happening even when you take the covid uh, whole issue where is the integration there is no integration at all the 2 3 percent who are dying are dying horrible deaths in the sense their families are not able to join in their families are, don't i mean you know it's very very traumatic for them so unless we take ownership and make make sure that this happens we'll go on talking sorry to say this but <laughs> no but again that same thing about the glass half full or half empty i i like to think that it's half full yeah sure <laughs> and we we'll share so that sometimes so, so i can. i think we can we can keep going on uh Yes. Uh, thank you, Roop, for uh, as usual an awesome presentation. Thank you, sir. Uh, I learned I learned nothing new. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I heard you so many times, but the good news is that my good wife is listening to it on another laptop, and it was her question about the COVID situation. So thank you very much. Uh, as usual, thank you, Dwani. You were always you. brilliant, and uh, I think it's a it's a fantastic. Uh, effort to make people understand this and if anybody is interested perhaps they could email you or you know yeah. maybe ibc and we can make sure that we can have one more session like this sure uh, jayda as usual uh, thank you for your super duper uh, you know concise looking at uh, the various questions on the chat so thank you very overall, much overall super evening and and god bless all of you Yeah, and the glasses I... reminded you of something else. So anyway, so before <laughs> that, before that, um, so can we all? Uh, I'll wish Dr. Roop a belated, a one-day belated happy birthday. So from That's all of us much. in the in this web in this. Yeah, but talk, so. but you know you know I'm I'm very sad because last year when he turned sixty, I was there to celebrate, and I I'm now sequestrated in my house for the last four months. You can always have a Zoom and exchange the classes. So there you go. So yeah. thank you, thank you very much, everybody. Bye, Bye Rajni. God bless. Bye. 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 So we'll thank you. Thank you very much. Meet again. Thank you so much. Bye. 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 Thanks.